I'm a member of the CVPS Steering Committee. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Judy Semrock. But first, I have a couple of announcements for the Photo Society. Our spring photo walk is underway. Members should have received an email from Jerry Jelinek with details for the walk. The walk is going to run through May 3rd, and like our uh, previous walks, we'll go over um, a couple of weeks to uh, deal with the COVID situation. The location is the Chippewa Creek Picnic Area in Brooksville Reservation, and the subject is spring wildflowers. The critique will be on Wednesday, May 5th, and it will be on Zoom. More details are in Jerry's email and on our website and on our Facebook page. Our next Wednesday presentation will be Wednesday, May 19th. Betsy Banks will present the magic of Acadia National Park and we're looking forward to her presentation. Right now, I would like to introduce field biologist and naturalist, Judy Semrock. Judy is the founder of Chrysalis in Time, the first Ohio chapter of the North American Butterfly Association. Judy also serves on the board of the Ohio Bluebird Society and the Ohio Ornithological Society Conservation Committee. She has co-authored two natural history guides, Dragonflies and Damselflies of Northeast Ohio and Goldenrods of Northeast Ohio, a field guide to identification and natural history. Those are both excellent field guides, guides and I'm happy to say I've got both of those in my library. For the past 20 years, Judy has worked in the Natural Aries Division for the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. A former petroleum geologist and science teacher, Judy loves to learn about and share her passion for the natural world through hikes, interpretive programs, and photography. Uh, please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Um, just type them into the chat box and we will ask them of Judy in the order in which they are received. Judy, I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute myself, and you can take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my little video and start with the, the program. So I'm going to be talking about a lot of different things that we might see or not see in nature. So before... Uh, once I get on a slide, I may ask you to take a look at it and see what you can see uh, in the slide. Uh, some of you may pick it out right away. Some of them might be a little harder to see, but we'll start off with this one. There's something in this uh, photo. And again, a lot of the things I will explain why the creature, insect, whatever behaves the way that it does. So in this photo, hopefully you're seeing uh, something that looks like this. We have a great horned owl uh, hiding in a wonderful tangle of grapevines. And this is part of what they like to do, especially during the day when, you know, they're out hunting at night or at twilight or very early in the morning. But during the day, they want to keep away from mobbing birds such as crows, blue jays, things like that. So they tend to insert themselves into a very dense patch of whether they're conifers or again, these grapevine tangles so that it makes it harder to be seen so that they can spend the day doing their roosting good stuff. So that's, uh, I'll go through camouflage evasion trickery and mimicry, but just some examples here. We have one of the damselflies. This is a river jewelwing, which is an Ohio listed species, but again, Things like damselflies and dragonflies need to be able to capture something that is moving. So if you're very, very still and you are hiding and you don't move, then you likely will not be eaten by them. And you can see these two little guys underneath this blade of grass that this damselfly is perched on. While they can't be seen or they're being evasive by hiding, uh, that's, that's what keeps them from being eaten. Trickery is where there is some feature to the plant or the animal that is tricking the item to either come into their realm so that they can feed on it uh, by uh, a variety of measures. And we'll talk about that as well. And then we have mimicry where you have species that may not be poisonous or 
they just might be a regular old insect or a regular old bird, but they might look like or mimic something else that may contain poisons or a fluid that is distasteful so that they can hopefully pass the test and not be eaten. So remember all of these things are doing and looking the way that they are in order to not be eaten. So some of uh, the terminology and what we'll be talking about, camouflage or crypsis <laughs> is the ability to blend with the surrounding environment by masking coloration, noise, patterns, and even their smell. Evasion is where they are escaping or avoiding uh, a predator, uh, whether it's the way that they, where they sit, how they sit, what position they present, trickery is the use of strategies to attract prey or deceive predators. And then mimicry is there's three main types of mimicry, Batesian, Malarian, and Wasmanian, but I'm mainly going to talk about Batesian and Malarian and for this because otherwise we could just go on for hours. Uh, and then mimicry is the resemblance of one creature, which is the mimic, to another, which is the model, so that a third observer, a possible predator, is deceived. And we'll talk about those and why that's important. So when you are in the food chain of nature, keep in mind that if you're at the bottom of the food chain, who are your predators? Are they attacking or potentially going to feed on you from above? or feed on you from below. So depending on how you are being viewed by a potential predator has a lot to do with the patterning on your body, whether it's the dorsal side or the ventral side, uh, or even, even as you are looked at from the side or where you hide. Keep in mind that all these little guys at the bottom, which includes many of our insects or even the plants, being at the bottom, they have to, they have to be able to ward off predation by how they are viewed by their predators. So for example, here's a group of our a group of butterflies that are in this same group called the angle wings because you can see how they have an odd edge to the outside edge of their wings. So we have the eastern comma, the question mark, and the gray comma. Most of the time when they are feeding, their wings are closed. And you could see the upper row of photos where the underside of the wing looks very non-colorful. It looks like bark. It looks like uh, a rustling leaf. And that is because they don't want to call attention to themselves because if they are to open their wings, as you see at the bottom, then those bright orange colors and the, the contrast of the orange and black along with the spots can make them more visible. Uh, and if you are a butterfly or a moth, your predators don't really care much about your wings because there's not much nutrition in the wings. They are aiming for your body, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. So when they are feeding and potentially moving around, they are sap feeders as well. So that's why a lot of their undersides look like tree trunks because if the tree exudes sap, say from a woodpecker hole or from a, a gash in the trunk, they can be there feeding on that sap, but with their wings closed, they'll look just like the tree trunk. We also have um, a whole different array of how moths look, and we'll get more into that as we go on, but part of this has to do with these eye spots that they possess. A lot of times they'll just open their wings to a certain extent, but if they feel movement near them, they may open the wings the rest of the way to flash these eye spots. So here the, on the polyphemus, when the wings are closed, again, it, it's far more camouflage than when the wings are open. But the idea is, is to flash those wings, flash those spots, and potentially send a predator somewhere else. So looking at our reptiles, um, if you're a snake, your biggest predator, other than people that don't like snakes, uh, are going to be hawks and things that are going to feed, feed on them from above. Um, normally you see some of our bigger predators like hawks, Cooper's hawks, red-tailed hawks, red-shouldered hawks. They're probably the ones I see the most taking a snake. So they can hide in a variety of areas. Here's a little brown snake that's hiding 
in the crack of a peeling tree trunk. Here's a garter snake that's hiding underwater. And here's a black rat snake that's hiding in the uh, you know, branches of a tree. It's when they're out, remember that reptiles are hold their body temperature as the same temperature that's outside. Being cold blooded makes it a little difficult for them when the temperature is cold. So they come out onto the roads or they'll sit in a sunny patch so that the sun warms up their body so that they can then move. They are also at a disadvantage when they're, when they're in the middle of shedding their skin and growing larger because the shed can then glaze over their eyes and make their vision not very good. So if they feel movement around them, they will strike out even though they can't see very well. So along the bottom, you will see these snakes when they are out say, basking or more available, but the top pictures are showing where they might hide uh, so that they potentially aren't predated. So for example, here we have a northern water snake uh, basking in a wetland up on, on some branches and some grasses. And again, warming up by exposing the upper surface to the sunlight. But then you have this come along, a red-tailed hawk comes, grabs the snake. Usually if you see a predator like a red-tailed hawk or red-shouldered hawk carrying a snake, that usually means that it is carrying it to the nest. If it stops and eats it there, then it's feeding itself but it will take that entire snake and take it to the nest and let the young feed on it or teach the young how to feed on it. Uh, this shot was taken from a very long distance away when I happened to see the hawk carrying it. But you will see snakes being carried by hawks and you see them wriggling as the talons of the hawks are holding tight to them in order to make a food out of them. Uh, some of our amphibians, a lot of the times we'll see frogs sitting out, whether they're on lily pads or other um, aquatic plants. And again, they're doing the same thing. They're warming up in the sun, but they're also looking for bugs that they can then spring upon or use their tongues and be able to get them. And then you could see them there, somewhat camouflage, but, but easy to see for us. But there's the bullfrog sitting in the water. Usually what they'll do is hide amongst the vegetation and just have their, their eyes and their mouth and their, their ears. This is their ear, their little eardrum uh, out of the water because this is the group of herons are their biggest predators. So you could see this green heron coming along here and, and grabbing for something in the water. But again, amongst the duckweed and amongst the other floating or plants that cover the surface, that's a way that they can sort of hide because their predator does come from above. Blending into the background, we have a lot of things that eat in certain ways so that they can blend in. Uh, if you can see this, then we'll show you the head and the tail. This is a unicorn prominent moth caterpillar. And what this caterpillar does is it starts to feed on the plant and as it feeds on the leaf the necrotic or the dying tissue that it has fed on the day before or the day before that then provides a really great camouflage path for them to sit in that necrotic pathway and continue to feed on the live part of the leaf but Again, most of these caterpillars are feeding on the underside of the leaf because their biggest predator are gonna be birds. So if they're feeding on top of the leaf and they're a brown caterpillar that they are on a green leaf, they're gonna be very easy to see and they're gonna become a meal. So it's, it's very clever the way that they sort of chew this pathway. They wait for the tissue to turn brown and then they use that pathway as the way to continue to eat the green uh, green part of the leaves. So again, cryptic coloration is very good. Hopefully you see something in this picture. I'll give you a minute or two to take a peek. And let's see if you could see the barred owl in this cavity right in here. So again, owls during the day, you can find them. There's, there's ways, there's methods of looking for them. It doesn't mean they're always gonna be there. But anytime, remember owls cannot build their own nests. So 
If you're a great horned owl, you're going to be using the nest of a red-tailed hawk, red-shouldered hawk, a great blue heron. If you're a barred owl or a screech owl, you're looking for cavities. They can't use their, their talons to grab uh, bark or pieces of sticks to bring into a nest, nor can they use their bill to do that. So they have to use other nests or other openings. Anytime you see a broken off tree like this or a limb that has broken off and has left the cavity, don't forget to look in there because you may be surprised and see an owl sitting in there. Uh, when I came upon this tree, I saw the barred owl. I was a, it was a long distance away from it. So I took a couple of shots from a distance and then I walked around to the other side and here's where it was sitting. So front ways, very obvious, but from this side over here, you're not seeing much. And again, being in this cavity is just exactly what they like. They don't necessarily need to have a roof over their head, but the opening with a flat, somewhat of a flat base to it is very, very useful to them. They don't build any kind of pad in there. They don't bring any nesting material. They lay their eggs right in the cavity. Look for great horn owls on these larger nests. So you, sh you should be able to look at a great blue heron nest. Remember great horned owls are starting and have started and did start to nest in January and into February. Most of the young are furry now and you can find them in uh, areas in, in trees if, you're, if you know of where a nest was. But hopefully you can look at those nests and see which one has the great horned owl in it. And if it's hard to see, okay. So what you're looking for are these little ear tufts. And again, the, the female is the one who incubates the nest. She sits on those eggs in all types of weather, regardless of how cold it is, even if it's below zero, she can keep the temperature on those eggs to about 94 degrees. So because she's a larger bird, she needs a larger nest and that's how the the great blue heron nests work out. I've also seen them nest in bald eagle nests when the eagles aren't nesting. So a lot of times the owl babies are have either fledged or they're close to fledging by the time that the other birds are ready to come back and potentially, you know, reuse that nest if they do. Okay, here's during the day. Uh, Take a look in there, see what you can see. And again, this is something that can take place in the middle of the day. Let's get a little closer. Let's get a little closer still. And there we have our Eastern Screech Owl. And if we go back, there's where it was. So this was probably about, I don't know, um, 50 or 60 feet away, if not more, when I first spotted it. Uh, and then I don't like to get close to them because even though it looks like their eyes are closed during the day, they're open just a little bit and they're open just enough so that they can detect people, things that might, you know, bother them, predate them. So if you look really closely at the shot on the right, you can see, you can see just a little bit of an eyeball in there. And again, this is, remember that owl's eyes are very large and the idea is that it lets in a lot of light so that it can do its hunting at night. And so during the day when it's very bright and sunny, two reasons that they seek dark places like conifers and tangles and things like that is number one, the, the light that is let in is very, very bright to them. And number two, they don't wanna be uh, hounded by other birds trying to chase them out of where they might be sitting. Okay, let's take a look at some, another one. See what you can see in this photo. Getting, can you see anything there? Okay. And one more. Take a look right there. And getting a little closer, there's the great horned owl sitting on her nest. I believe the shot was taken like in January, snow, cold. But if we look again, sitting over here, again, those broken off tops of dead trees, 
uh, you know, a limb missing that might have a cavity is what they look for. And they can use, they can use the same area again in ensuing years, especially if they have a successful nesting period. But a lot of times after several years, they go back and they find that that tree has fallen because it's typically a dead tree or in the process of dying. All right, I hope your, your detection skills are getting better as we go. Let's see if you can see what's in here. And again, this is the time of year you might see this. Can you see the eye? Get a little closer. Okay. And that's an, an American woodcock. So again, they are, look at their back, look at the feathering patterns. Amazing, just amazing. And the idea is, is to, if you're on the ground, you need to really blend in and really be camouflaged. If you're about to be stepped on and they flush and they fly, but if you go back and you look and you can see how when you first look across there, it's a very difficult thing to see. I just happened to see it before I got too close. And again, very cryptic on purpose so that they aren't predated. I'm sure most everyone is familiar with the killdeer broken wing display, which is the idea of trying to attract you as a potential predator to go away from their nest so they act like they are injured thinking that you might go after them. So the photo that you see on the left is the way that they do it. They flare out the wings. They usually hold one wing higher or lower than the other. They flare out their tail. Here it is again, but in this picture you can see the see what she's trying to keep you away from. So let's look at the next one. Can you all see what's in that photo? Getting a little closer. Those are the killdeer eggs. Now typically what they do is when they, when they first lay them, they lay them with the points facing inward and then they continually flip them so that they're you know, kind of on a rotisserie. They keep moving them around, make sure that the youngsters are doing well inside of there. And then when they hatch, they're just absolutely adorable. So you can see here, they are, they're feathered. They're almost ready to go later that day after they hatch. So here was the first one hatching and you can see how well they blend into the gravel. Now we've got two, now we've got three. And again, they got those big feet. You can see them here underneath, right here. Their biggest problem or their biggest predator are the raccoons because the eggs, if they're found, the eggs will be eaten. And believe it or not, uh, white-tailed deer eat these eggs, eat a lot of eggs of ground nesting birds, our rare sparrows, things like that. So it's something that the researchers have captured on trail cams, especially on the prairie type birds. But killdeer are, that's probably their biggest predator is, are the raccoons. So if you take a look across there, now those little ones are out. Even at this stage, you're hoping that they are well camouflaged. And can you see the little ones spread across there? So mom or dad is on the left and you see the three young. And then there's the parent eggs below her in this picture. And there's the little young one that's ready to go later that same day. So again, being on gravel, especially with their coloration, is very helpful from a, you know, being cryptic. Okay, we're gonna get into a different group now. Everybody take a look at this. Tell me what you might see here. Getting a little closer. Getting a little closer or from a different angle. So here's what you're seeing. This was a red bat that was coming through during migration. It's so it was about, Oh, maybe four inches, three and a half to four inches from, from bottom, I should say, to top. And here's the wings all folded up. They will hide like that during the day. And then when it's time for them to migrate or move on at night, they will leave that. But you can see how they chose a spot. This is an elderberry or it chose a spot. This is an elderberry bush. There's some dead leaves in here. 
So without really knowing that that's a bat, when you first look at it, it certainly just looks like another sort of dead or piece of debris that's in, you know, that's somewhere in that meadow or somewhere in that area. And then there's the little face. You can see they've got, there's the little nose, hair of the wings folded up. You can see the ears and they really are a beautiful sort of cinnamon color. Okay, camouflage to hide. Hopefully you can see all of these on here. I was gonna zoom them all out and make them pretty much impossible to see, but I thought I would start off with making it a little bit easier. Most of these or many of these are in the geometric group, but you can see the outlines here. The arrows are pointing to the heads in each situation. And again, if you're a moth, your biggest predator is going to be the birds. So if you are easy to see, again, they, birds, bats, and praying mantis are the ones that are gonna pull off the wings and then go ahead and eat this nice, fat, juicy body, which is where they actually can get their energy from. Tree bark makes a wonderful place to hide. And hopefully you can look at that and sort of see what's there. Getting a little closer. And there you can see another moth. And again, a lot of times the moths will hide in these little crevices. The, uh, this is a, a big tulip tree, so you can see the bark looks a little bit different than typical tulip trees. But you can actually watch moths fly through the woods and they will actually select. It's like, how do they know what they look like? Because they actually select where to land based on their coloration. And it's just uncanny when you watch them in the woods and you're trying to find them again once they have landed. Okay, take another look here. Again, the predator of this. Looking at it from a lateral view, that is the caterpillar of the northern pearly eye butterfly. It is a sedge and grass eater. So you will see that here's the two little horns, the little pink horns, but they will align themselves vertically with the leaves or with the whatever it is that they're sometimes feeding on and sometimes not. Sometimes they'll go on another plant to go to their next instar rather than being on the plant where they might be feeding. And by looking very camouflaged, it's very difficult for a bird to pick them out. And that's what the adult looks like once it hatches from that caterpillar. Now, something else that we notice that a lot of our butterfly and moth wing edges can resemble a caterpillar. And this causes the birds to attack what they think is the larva at the wing edges. And then this can potentially allow for the adult to escape with only some tattered wings. So let's take a look at some other ones. So here we have our Cecropia moth. And if you look at this inside of the green oval, you will see how that edge looks just like a caterpillar. There's an eye, there's some patterning across the back. Looking down here at the Promethea, same kind of thing. You can see these look like legs with an eye. Sometimes here, these spots can look like legs just at the right orientation. Same thing here, this can sort of look like an eye with, a, with an elongate look to a potential caterpillar. And the same thing on the morning cloak. So a lot of times if you see these insects and you see tattered wings, it's because a bird has gone after them and been able to take a couple of pieces out and that's why you see uh, the wear and tear on them. Okay, again, to hide and to hunt. Take a look at this. This is a dragonfly larva that is in the water. And again, because of the sediment on top of the body, these are great as a larva in the water or as a nymph in the water. They spend one to seven years in the water before they ever hatch out into the dragonfly or the damselfly. If the water is very shallow and it's a very you know bright and hot summer, they can some of them can hatch out a little bit earlier, but they are spending their time in the water primarily eating mosquito larvae, fly larvae, things like that that 
we may not be crazy about, but they have these great jaws up here that open and close and can grab their prey. When they are ready to hatch out, they will climb up a plant in order to be able to get out of the water. They will split their skin and then the adult dragonfly or damselfly will hatch out. The fluid from their body will fill the, vein, the venation in their wings. And later that day, they should be ready to, to fly unless the weather's really bad or it's snowing or cold or uh, raining. And again, dragonflies need to be able to see its prey moving. So if you're gonna hide underneath that stem, you better stay there until that dragonfly goes someplace else because as soon as you leave, this one in particular is a very, um, it's a great predator out in the field and over ponds and things like that. Uh, Eastern pond hawk male, so that can eat a lot of things. Okay, take a look in here, see what you might be able to see in here. Let's give it a circle. Let's get a little closer. So what you are seeing here is a dragonfly. And what they will do is they will put the stem between them and whatever they think their predator might be. And the idea is that they must think that we can't see them if they can't see us. And by putting their face or their eyes behind there, they're only showing this sort of X-wing looking feature here, which is a little hard to pick out if you're looking at it face on. However, if you're looking at it from the top or from the side, that's what that species, that's a calico pennant, and that's what that species would look like from above. So if you're a bird and you're looking for hunting a dragonfly or you're approaching it from a, an interior angle, you may not see it. So that's a way that they sort of look at their protection because if you look at their eyes, in particular, they're sort of a reddish, brownish, and that could stand out if the eyes were exposed. Same thing here, they will align themselves on branches so that their body is hidden and just their wings are there. Once they start moving or hatching out of the water, here's our great crested flycatcher that's bringing one to the, to the kids at the nest. The tree was right over here that it was feeding. And dragonflies and damselflies can be very predatory. Bigger dragonflies love to eat smaller dragonflies or smaller damselflies. Here's our barn swallow grabbing a dragonfly off the water to feed it to a young. So again, you move, if they can see you, they will find you, they will get you, they will eat you. Okay, some of the trickery that uh, insects use. This is a photo of a West Virginia white butterfly, which is a globally imperiled species. We do have some places here in Northeast Ohio where we find them. They have a very short flight period. They fly from like mid-April to mid-May, sort of into the end of May. And that's mainly because their food plant for their caterpillars are the toothworts or the cardamines, which is a species of mustard. Uh, unfortunately for them, garlic mustard is also in that same group. And remember the butterflies and moths taste with their feet. So when they land on a plant, they can tell by landing on the plant that their caterpillar either can or cannot eat that plant. So the female will curl her abdomen up underneath the leaf. She will lay an egg, which looks like this lower left-hand picture. And those eggs have to hatch pretty quickly because the toothworts will start to recede in, back into the ground, lose their upper growth by the end of, um, by the end of May. So it's got to go through all of its instars and be ready to make a chrysalis before their plant is gone. So this is a first instar caterpillar. And what they do is the first thing that they eat when they hatch is their open eggshell. And they do that for two reasons. Number one, they do it to get the protein from the eggshell. And number two, they do it to remove the evidence of an open egg because a lot of our uh, species of wasps that are predatory, they will look for an open egg. And once they find an open egg, they will look for the caterpillar nearby and then inject their ovipositor, lay eggs inside. And then of course their larva will eat that caterpillar from the inside out. 
But this is, you know, this is quite small once it first hatches out, so it has eaten the eggshell. Uh, so you're looking at something that's certainly maybe a quarter of an inch long, certainly uh, could be smaller when it first comes out, uh, maybe the size of a grain of rice. So again, as a smaller one, it's important because otherwise you could be fed upon. Well, next we have our bug eaters, which they are using trickery to bring in some food. And we have our pitcher plants on the left and we have our round these sundew on the right. Pitcher plants have what we call nectar trails. So remember that insects see in ultraviolet light. So these lines that point down into the reservoir in the leaves of the plant, which look like a pitcher and look like they have fluid in them. These look like an eat at Joe's sign to these insects because to them it's like this neon sign pointing directly downward. So we'll talk about the pitcher plants first. So the insect comes in, it follows those nectar trails because they can see the reflection off of the liquid that is in the reservoir. This is the flower that the pitcher plant puts up. And as you can see, it really doesn't look like a normal flower. There are some little pollen things on the, between these sections of leaves, but you don't really see insects pollinating or getting nectar from this because they basically feed from the insects that actually fall into the fluid and then get uh, fed upon once the uh, insect is in the fluid. So what happens is along the edge, the upper edge is, are a bunch of downward pointing hairs. So if the insect gets in, falls into the reservoir, it starts to try to climb out where we have this little ant. He's doing his best to come on out of that pitcher plant. And unfortunately he didn't make it, but you could see the hairs here. So he's trying to climb up these hairs in order to get back out of here, but he fell back in. And, and you could see little remnants of insects. So if you're familiar with areas that might have pitcher plants, you know, get down on your hands and knees and look in there and you can frequently find little bodies of insects that have fallen in and become a prey item for the pitcher plant. Let's look at the sundew. So I'm sure many of you remember the old um, Ben Franklin or Woolworth story. You could go and get a little Venus flytrap plant in a little cup and you bring it home and you throw a bunch of flies in there. Well, the sundew is, is doing something very similar. These long strands with these little bulbous ends look very, very shiny. So they look like they have fluid on them. And when you're an insect and you see this arrangement like this, you can see that it looks like it's got a liquid or a sap. And you frequently then will climb into or try to access these little ends. So this is a close up of, you can see the inside of the center. And when they do, here's a crane fly that probably tried to get to a fly that was already in the actual leaf. And what happens is the leaf then closes over it. And this is a, a damsel fly that got caught inside of here. And it just folds over kind of like a, um, it's just like, a, like it's on a hinge almost. And it's, Inside of there, it assimilates all the fluids and stuff out of the, the actual whatever it's catching. And then it will feed on that. And then when it's done, it opens back up again, which then allows it to catch, you know, catch something else. Now, sundews do have a little flower that's on a long skinny stalk. And it's really cool if, you, if you're familiar with where sundews are, you can go take a look. Uh, they're not blooming now, but they will be blooming later in the summer. But it's a tiny little flower and it does attract some tiny little bugs for nectaring. But for the most part, the nutrition for this plant comes from what lands in there. Now I have seen several times where there might be an insect in the open pad of the sundew struggling to get out and the movement attracts a little spring peeper and the peeper goes after the insect. And unfortunately, if the peeper's just newly hatched and kind of small, it also can become a prey item because it may not be able to pull 
enough away from the open part of the sundew plant to get out before it closes up. Okay, let's move on into mimicry. So as we said before, that the, this is the resemblance of one creature, the mimic, to another creature, the model, so that a third observer, a possible predator, is deceived. So we have three types, Batesian, Malarian, and Wasmanian. And the Batesian mimicry, that's the one we see, the top two are the ones we see the most of. So this occurs when the model is toxic and the mimic is harmless. So an example of that is the pipevine swallowtail with the red spotted purple and the spice bush. And then we'll move on to malaria. And the Wasmanian uh, occurs when the mimic resembles the host in order to live in the same structure or with them. And that's one that's a little harder uh, because some of those things can be really, really small. But let's take a look at some of the Batesian mimicry. Um, the upper photo, I took off the net because I was trying to find a good one that showed the open wings to show you how the color makes such a difference. So the upper butterfly is a pipevine swallowtail. We are sort of at the northern edge of its range here in northern and northeast Ohio. It's more prevalent down south because it has a very particular plant that the caterpillars need and those are called um, pipe vine plants. Uh, we have the native pipe vine down more in southern Ohio, but you can plant the pipe vine vine. Uh, it's in the Aristolochia group, and they have to lay their eggs on that because that's what their caterpillars can eat. Now, because of the acids that are in the Aristolochia plant, it makes both the caterpillars and the butterfly distasteful. So if you mimic yourself, like the red spotted purple does and like the spice bush swallowtail does to that a lot of times you are left alone by the birds uh, in order to survive so again they it's not so much that the acidic content is in the wings but it's in the head the thorax and the abdomen so you can see how those colors can look very very similar Let's look at them when the wings are closed. They also look very similar. So a pipe vine swallowtail has one set of orange ro a row, okay? But the spice bush has two rows of orange. And then the red spotted purple, of course, doesn't have tails, but it has one set of rows here, but it has these three dots. So when the wings are closed, that's also a way that they all look very similar to each other. Same thing with what we have with our monarch butterfly caterpillars and the black swallowtails. So while they look different, as a bird looks at them, they could mistake them because you could see they're black and yellow and whitish. And you could see the monarchs here on the left and the black swallows here on the right. Uh, the black swallow tails do not feed on a plant that gives them any uh, toxicity to them, but we know that the monarchs feed on milkweeds, which do have a toxicity to them. And when you look at the butterflies, they don't look anything alike. So it's more about the protection coming as you are a larva or as you are the caterpillar. So the monarch is the model and the black swallowtail is the mimic. Let's go off and look at our spice bush swallowtail caterpillar. Now we know that a lot of our sp um, swallowtail caterpillars have these really outrageous looking eye spots. Well, they're not eye spots really, they're just a pattern on their skin. Their eyes are really down here by their mouth because this is where they're feeding. So they wanna be able to see what they're eating. But again, this, this whole item here is sort of mimicking a smooth green snake. And again, you can see the color is very similar even to the point where the yellow along the sides is similar to the yellow that's along the sides of the spice bush. So the spice, spice bush larva is the mimic to the green snake, which is the model. And again, if you're a green snake and you and a, and a bird wants to come after you, you're going to get more than what you bargained for. So especially if this spice bush only has its face sticking out from underneath leaves, 
say, of the spice bush plant or shrub, then it looks even more like the snake. And when you take another closer look at it, here we have the tiger swallowtail on the left. So here's where you can see, this is the face. Here's the little jaws down here chewing. These are part of the eye structures down here. But again, when you look at the face of this caterpillar, it certainly can look like a snake. Now what they will do or what they can do, and you can see it here as well. Here's the spice bush. It's in the process of laying down a silken pad. If you can see all these little lines, these are silk lines that the caterpillar lays down during the day so that it can fold the leaf up around its body to protect itself. And you can see on this shot here, these silvery looking lines are the top view of what you can see here. But the idea is, if you're not familiar, when a bird or something wiggles the leaf that either the tiger swallowtail or the spice bush is on, they will rear back or they will rear up and make it look something like this to where you can see the eyes, you can see the front of it, and it certainly can look like a green snake from that angle. And again, if it, if it chases that bird away, then that's what it needed, that's what it wants to do. Now let's go into some of our moths where we look at eye spot mimicry. So the eye spots on these wings can mimic those from feared predators. So here we have our polyphemus, the wings are closed. You do see two eye spots here on the upper wings, but when they open the wings, you can see these eye spots. And again, once you see them as an ang from an angle, because frequently they're perched on tree trunks, take a look at that. So if you are a bird and you take a look at this and you see these eye spots and you can see how similar they might look to a fox's eye. Again, it only takes a moment to scare that bird away or that predator away because from their angle or certainly from this vantage point, those look like two eyes of something much larger than what the moth is. Here's our Io moth. And when the wings are closed, looks like a yellow butterfly sitting on a tree trunk. But if they get startled, they open their wings. They have these very noticeable eye spots here. And again, if you turn it at the right angle, you can see how they can look very similar to the eyes of a barred owl. Because frequently these IO moths are as a moth, as the adult moth, not so much the caterpillar, but as the adult moth, are in the woods. Uh, they can be along uh, on the sides of tree trunks or on branches. So you can see how it's the mimicking of a potential predator or something bigger than the bird that's trying to eat it. Now, of course, the Io moth as a caterpillar has got a bunch of hairs and, and spines on it. It is not one to handle because it will, the little hairs at the end of the little hairs will break off onto your hand and they will hurt for a while and they sting and they're not pleasant. Here are some of the others. We have some, a lot of in the group of sphinx moths. Again, if they feel a vibration, they open those wings, they show those eye spots. And again, just that potential, sometimes they will even beat their wings to make it look like the eyes are moving. The luna moth, many of you are familiar with luna moths. When the wings are closed, you don't see much, but these little eye spots on the fore wings, if they start to open them a little bit, you could see the eye spots on the hind wings. But more importantly, now, you know, some people have written in before and said, gee, that looks like the face of an elephant. I certainly wouldn't expect to see an elephant in the tree. And you're right, you wouldn't expect to see, but you can see how from this vantage point, you're looking at the underside. So now you see these two eye spots, which no longer make it look like a moth it, to a bird. It makes it look like it's something else and it might be something to stay away from. We also have tail and eye spot mimicry. And typically you will see these in butterflies that have the smaller tails. Uh, this is, this will be in the group of hair streaks or Eastern tail blues. Typically when these butterflies feed, they are feeding upside down to where their head is more downward. 
their tails are pointing upward, which makes them look like antenna. And then the spots on the hind wings can look like eyes. So when they're feeding or nectaring, they'll hold those tails up, they'll hold those eyes up, they'll wiggle those hind wings as they're feeding on the flower down below. And if the bird goes after it thinking that this is the face, then they might pull the tails off or they might pull the pull an eye off, but that's not really where their eyes are. They're down here. The face is down here. The important part of the body is here. So again, they typically can escape. You see the same thing on some of the swallowtails. And again, here's that black swallowtail. Here are the eye spots. Here are the tails that can look like antenna. And this is what can happen. Here's our tiger swallowtail. You see the tails, you can't see the eye spots very well, but they're right in here. And this is what can happen. A bird gets a hold of it. It has pulled off those lower wings or the hind wings, but the butterfly can still fly. It can get to a plant, it can nectar, and it can still survive. So that can be something that you see here where the tatteredness and parts of the wings are missing. Sometimes you can actually see where the butterfly had its wings folded and the bird attacked it and it actually pulled out chunks that line up with the other wing. And that tells you that the wings were together when the butterfly was attacked. So again, you can see these types of things and you can see how despite their efforts that they still can be attacked. Okay, let's talk about our malarian mimicry. And these are when two toxic species look similar and both share protection. So we always used to know that the viceroy looks like the monarch and we used to think that the viceroy wasn't or didn't have any uh, chemicals in them and so therefore they look like the monarch, which does. But with further work, we then realized that the viceroy, because of what they feed on, also has uh, a chemical substance in them that makes them not very good tasting. So the monarch on the left, you can see there that's nectaring as an adult, but as a caterpillar, it feeds on milkweed and it gets, it sequesters the toxins of the uh, cardiac glycoside components and they are distasteful. I've actually seen a bird go after a monarch take it out of the sky, try to pull a wing off, try to start eating at the end of the abdomen and then totally drop it. However, the viceroys now, we know that by feeding on willow and poplar trees, they also pick up the phenolic glycosides and they also can taste bad. So while they may look like each other, and again, that mimicry, birds may know more that the monarch is distasteful, but if they also try to eat the viceroy, that also is going to be distasteful. Here's our mimicry in other species that hide to hunt. So hopefully you can see both of the predators that are in these photos. You are looking at the goldenrod crab spiders, which hide in the plants, resemble the blooms, and can actually, over a period of a couple of days, change their color when they get on another plant of a different color. So typically they are white and they will be in white colored flowers, but they also can change to a yellow because the upper layer of their carapace, if you will, or their upper layer of their, especially their abdomen here, can change over time as a result of the way the sun shines on them and it's an actual color change so that it blends. So what it does is it just hides and it waits in the flower head for something to come along. One of our other species that we have, I don't know if you can see that, this is uh, one of our composite flowers. And you know, there's a lot of little brown things in the center of that. But what you're looking at is an ambush bug. And ambush bugs are another one of the hide and hunt groups. And as you look at it from the side, you could see that it's, you know, quite an imposing looking species. It's not very big and, and you can see that it's got these huge muscular sets of four legs, the front set of legs that open and close along this seam. They capture 
their prey and then they feed on it. Their mouth is up here. But again, they can really blend in because they tend to sit on parts of the plant that look brown and green at the same time. And here's what happens. So you see the honeybee that is now being caught by two different ambush bugs. There's one here and there's one down here. And the honeybee came onto the flower to either nectar or get pollen. And you can see how it did not see the ambush bugs and then got caught. Another one of our really great uh, predatory, good predatory insects are the lacewings. The one we know the best or we see the most often are the green lacewings. Their larvae are all predatory. So you see the larva here, these got these sickle shaped jaws. But what they do is they pile this stuff on top of their backs. Uh, they're also called trash bugs. And for example, they will get into a group of say woolly aphids. They will take some of the material that the woolly aphids have discarded from their body. They will pile them on top of their body and they will move in with the rest of the aphids and they crawl along the branches and they just eat the aphids because here's the face down here. There's the jaws down there, just like you see here. So if you're a bunch of aphids on a branch and this thing comes climbing in, you're not gonna recognize it as not being one of your own because it, it piles all this and glues this material to its back in order to be like the the wolf in sheep's clothing in order to predate these insect. So here you can see these are the woolly aphids. You come across here, here's that lacewing larva with all of this piled on top of it. This is what a woolly aphid looks like uh, at the bottom. So here is the adult lacewing. This is the larval lacewing. And then you could see the woolly aphids on the tree trunk or tree branch. And you can just imagine how this green lacewing larva can walk amongst them and feed on them. So it's a great predatory uh, way of getting into the situation that you wanna feed upon. Getting into some of our amphibians. Remember in nature, red means sort of stay away. And it really does mean that. This is one of our Eastern spotted newts. This is actually a larval form. When they're adult, they look more green. But again, not a good one to eat because they can exude a chemical from the top of their or out of their skin if they are being played with or uh, threatened. But here we have our northern red salamander. Again, red sort of means like kind of stay away from me, but I came upon this garter snake trying to eat this eastern or northern red salamander and you could see that it's got part of the head in in its mouth already, legs are out here, the rest of it's hanging down behind it. And I just sat there and I watched it and I didn't do or make any noise. And then it dropped it and you could see there's some little nicks on the side. It probably had from the face to about right, right behind the legs in its mouth. But then the salamander probably kicked out its chemical along the surface of its skin. Didn't taste so good to the snake so it then it dropped it. And here's our spring peeper hiding in a spider web. While it can still hunt from that, it's harder for a predator to get to it because it would have to get through the spider web. So that's another way of, of hiding or, or deceiving a predator to maybe not attack it. We have a great series uh, of color changes that come with the gray tree frogs they can alter their color to match the location. So here's one that is gray because it's sitting in a little cavity in a, uh, in a tree trunk. This one has slowly changed its color so it matches what it's on. This one jumped from a plant that was more whitish. And as it jumped onto the greener plants, I sat there for maybe 15 or so minutes and you can see how it's starting to already change to the green to match the current location that it is on. So that's just something that they do to help protect themselves. So let's take a look. Um, see if you can see what's in this picture. Let's get a little closer. 
Let's get a little closer still. And let's get a little closer still. And here's that gray tree frog right here. It started off right here. And again, this is where they sit during the day. Um, they're called tree frogs for a reason. They can hide in all these little cavities. Sometimes when they call and they're in a cavity, the sound really gets magnified because it's sort of like in a, in a it sounds like they're in a tin can calling and the sound can really be, you know, project itself. It can actually lay its eggs in the water that might collect in the cavity. Uh, but again, eyes look closed during the, you know, during the day they're, they're trying to not look very conspicuous because this would be a great meal for a bird in particular. And again, because they can hide and, and wedge themselves in a good little spot, they may be very hard to see. And this one is one of my favorites. Um, the story that surrounds this is pretty cool. So this is called a silver spotted skipper. This is its egg, a really cool looking egg. Most of the moth and butterfly eggs have a lot of little lines or crenulations or um, parts of the eggshell that add to the stiffening of the eggshell to make it hard so that it isn't easily picked up it's not easily taken off of whatever it was laid on, usually a plant, and it can survive, you know, heavy winds or even precipitation and things like that. So it, it has that structure to it. Well, when it hatches out and it grows into its final instar, it has this beautiful looking caterpillar with this brown head and these little orange eyes. But as a butterfly, you can see that when the wings are open, it looks like this. When the wings are closed, it has this spot on it hence the name Silver Spotted Skipper. Well, what, the, what they learned through their research, again, all caterpillars are pretty much in peril, not only from birds, but from our predatory wasps. And what the wasps do, the females have these long ovipositors. It could be an ichneumonoid, it could be a braconid, it could be several, many species in that group. But if they find a caterpillar like this, um, they will lay their eggs in it. She will actually stick her ovipositor down through the skin, lay the egg, the egg hatches, and again, it starts to eat that caterpillar from the inside out. However, the way that the wasps find these caterpillars is that they can smell the frass. And if you're not familiar, frass is the scientific name or the somewhat better sounding name than caterpillar poop. So when this caterpillar is growing and it's eating its leaves and it is pooping, normally if you're familiar with, with the monarch frass, you can see that a monarch caterpillar just sort of lets the frass out and sometimes it collects on the leaf that's right next to the stem. But they have found that this particular species will be able to or can fire its frass more than four feet away from its body. So for example, if it's sitting on a leaf and it's got to go, it can fire that frass outward from this area down here and it lands wherever it lands. And if you're a braconid wasp or one of the predatory wasps and you come upon that frass because your scent organs have picked it up, you're going to look at where you are around that frass to try to find that caterpillar. Well, you're probably not likely going to find it because it's going to be four feet away somewhere else, up higher, not necessarily down low, but it could be. So it's just a great, great story. And I would have loved to have been in the lab when they were able to see this actually happening because I think it would just have been a great uh, experience to see. And then we have this whole group of not only caterpillars and moths, but they're called the bird poop moth or they look like bird poop and they look like that for a reason. So if you're one of these smaller moths, and keep in mind these are pretty small, we're talking some of these are half an inch or less. Um, this one is actually named the bird poop moth. So if you look like bird poop, you're not likely going to be fed on by a bird. So in the earlier instars of the giant swallowtail, They've got this big white end to it. This can look like, for example, if it's down near the ground, it can look like turkey scat because 
Turkey scat usually has a white end to it and it's darker in the, on the other ends. The viceroy caterpillar has this white looking surface to it. Again, while it's feeding on this little willow stem, it just looks like bird poop laying there. Same thing with the bird poop moth. If it's just laying there, remember as an adult moth, you're going to be looking for nectar on plants. You're not going to be feeding on the actual leaves. Now your caterpillars might, which is why when you're a caterpillar and you're sitting on the top end of a leaf, you better look pretty, um, pretty camouflaged or pretty protected. When this giant swallowtail gets bigger, it's not going to look anything like this. And that way, when it's little and it looks like that, and it survives then as a larger caterpillar, it can then take to the undersides where it may not be so easily seen. And this was one that I happened to see when I was out and about, and I saw these two goldenrod leaf miner beetles. And while it looked like um, they, were, they were mating, they had been mating in the beetle world and a lot of the insect species, the male is smaller than the female and he takes his um, over his, his organ, if you will, and he will mate with the female here, fertilizing the eggs. She will then lay the eggs. You see four of them here stacked on top of each other. And then she spreads this layer of poop over top of the eggs. They then disperse, the parents go away. These eggs are sitting here with this line of poop on them. So I'm sure it doesn't smell great. It doesn't look very appetizing. So it's very likely that those eggs will go without having a predator find them and potentially eat them. So, I, so we should just be grateful that the protective feces application is not in the human life cycle process. Uh, so, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot to be thankful for out there. And remember, when you're out and about, nature's eyes are always on the lookout. Most things see you way before you see them. Um, here's our little fox hiding behind uh, vegetation. He's, here's the beautiful eyes of the box turtle. Here's our barred owl, middle of the day, hiding in a tree. Uh, our little damselfly, uh, it's called the blue-fronted dancer. Here's that gray tree frog again that has turned into a green looking tree frog because it's sitting on a green leaf. Good places to look for this tree frog looking green can be, for example, inside of the little reservoirs of cup plant where the leaves meet the stem. Um, skunk cabbage because the leaves are broad and they typically are in wetlands where they can stay moist. And here's our morning cloak butterfly where you can see the tongue curled up, the compound eyes the very furry body because this is the one that can over one of the species that can overwinter as an adult so all those extra little hairs on them help them to stay warmer when it's very cold and they they're hibernating under tree bark or something like that so here's some here's a scary face for the astounding world of nature and again this is a moth that's it's probably not even a half an inch long, but you can see how when it puts its wings together, it can look like this sort of a skeleton face. I should probably use that as a happy Halloween card. But again, all these creatures have all these patterns and all the ways of looking a certain way so that the predators um, don't attack them or they can actually make it through to where they can mate and lay eggs and let their progeny continue. And with that, that is my last slide. So if you have any questions, I am ready to go. If you have questions, if you could type them into the chat box, um, we will um, address them in the order that we get them. No questions? So you all need to get out there and look for things that are hiding, look for things that are camouflaged. You'll be surprised what you can find if you just, you know, take some time to look. Look for something that doesn't quite look right on a leaf or something sticking out from the edge of a leaf or something in tree bark that may, may not look like it should be there. And that's 
frequently the way that you can find these you know camouflage or mimic type species well judy thank you so much for your presentation i really learned a lot from this and i i just appreciate the level of expertise that you bring to the subject and uh, i'll be going out with my macro lens and looking for all these there you go there you go um ring lights can help with your with your equipment but you know nowadays the some of these uh fixed lens camera these little point and shoots and a lot of people have you know their cameras on their phones are actually you know really good if you're out and about especially with kids and they have phones you know help them to look for these kinds of things because you can find them and you can be amazed by what you see in their patterns and when you look at something like this moth picture you can see that each this pattern is made up of a bunch of scales this is not like somebody painted it each one of these little lines that you see is a scale that's overlapping another scale so butterflies and moths all their wings are made up of a collection of scales that overlap like uh, shingles on a roof so it's it makes these really cool patterns because they know through you know evolution and uh that whatever's going to hunt them may be above them and so their patterning has to look like that so just a different way of looking at things and i hope you can all get out there and find something cool and if you find a bug or something you don't know send it to me and i'll help you with it or you can put it on iNaturalist. A lot of people are doing that now to get um, some species information. Well, thank you so much for your presentation this evening, Judy. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I hope to see you and I hope to see everybody else out in the field sometime soon. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Thanks, Judy. Take care, everybody. Good mm. night. Thank you.